Since ancient times, the holy scriptures of mankind have reported about celestial visitors which came to earth from the depths of the universe to teach their knowledge to their chosen ones, their prophets, and their messengers. According to the Holy Bible, Abraham entertained three angels. When they later visited the city of Sodom, they were believed to be normal earthmen. When the Israelites left Egypt, an angel appeared as a pillar of fire and guided them to the mountain of Horeb. The prophet Elias ascended to heaven in a fiery chariot. Ezekiel described the apparition of a great cloud with raging fire engulfing itself. In its mist, like the color of amber, also from within it came four living creatures. They had the likeness of a man. St. Paul reminded the Hebrews that some have unwittingly entertained angels. There is one instance which is echoed in the Bible, which is the story of Enoch uh, being taken up to heaven to be with the gods. In the Bible, uh, the statement is very brief about it. There's much more about it in the so-called books of Enoch, of which we have two versions that describe the voyage, actually two voyages. Uh, one time he came back to earth, another time he was taken uh, to be with the divine beings. And um, this is really a, a version of uh, a Sumerian tale, uh, in this particular case, of a uh, person called Enme Duranki, which uh, is a title given to him after the abduction or visitation, uh, which means uh, the master, the master of the bond between heaven and earth. And it specifically says that, among other things, he was uh, taught the secrets of mathematics, the secrets of the calendar, and the secrets of the movements of the planets. It is said about Imhotep, the inventor of the hieroglyphs and architect of the first pyramid of Egypt, that he was a student of the watchers who came down to earth in their celestial boats. Further references to these cosmic messengers are offered in the Vedas, the sacred scriptures of ancient India, which belong to the oldest written records in the history of mankind. Uh, according to the Vedic literature, there are many different uh, types of human-like beings living within the universe, and they're all descended from an original common ancestor. Uh, according to the Vedic writings, there has been uh, communication between uh, human beings and other uh, types of human-like beings in, throughout the universe uh, for thousands and thousands of years. Uh, this used to be, in fact, more common than it is now. Uh, according to the Vedic literature, we're now in a period called the Kali Yuga, in which communication between humans and higher uh, forms of life is somewhat curtailed. So actually the idea is that uh, this communication was much more uh, extensive in the distant past. Why did these contacts take place? Well, there's uh, the ultimate question of purpose boils down to the question of what is the ultimate purpose of life? Why did this universe come into being in the first place? Uh, the basic concept that you have in the Vedic literature, uh, starting in the middle, basically, of the explanation, is that you have uh, living beings who have uh, spirit souls, the soul is the essence of the being, uh, who are in a state of ignorance. These living beings are situated in bodies made of the material elements. And because of these material bodies, they don't understand the true nature of the self. So there's an evolutionary process whereby, through experience in the material world, in different material bodies, one can gradually elevate one's consciousness. So life on Earth also is a school, so to speak, in which uh, living beings take bodies of uh, human form on the Earth to undergo certain experiences, which in due course will elevate their uh, consciousness. So the purpose of communication from higher beings in the universe is to aid in this process, to give people instructions which will ultimately enable them to attain to a higher platform of consciousness. So the idea is that on the Earth, uh, people are basically living in a state of ignorance, uh, but from time to time, beings from the uh, higher uh, systems within the universe will come down to the Earth 
and transmit uh, spiritual knowledge to the people here on the earth. So in this way, you have different religions uh, developing. Of course, that's a very complex process because once knowledge is transmitted to this earth, then people begin to do things with that knowledge. And so you can have the development of different uh, religious uh, creeds and so on and so forth. In 1952, Lord Desmond Leslie, a celebrated fighter pilot of World War II, nephew of Sir Winston Churchill and scion of the oldest Irish nobility, wrote the first book about these obvious parallels between modern-day UFO sightings and descriptions in those ancient Indo-Vedic writings. I was in a friend's library, and we were waiting. There was nothing to do, so I just suddenly saw this book. Or rather, it seemed to jump out of the shelf at me. Atlantis and Lemuria, written in 1890 by Scott Elliot, published by the Theosophists, with maps of Atlantis and descriptions, and all taken from the astral of the Akashic Record. It is very exciting. The thing that interested me most was the description of their flying machines, which it said were circular, and glowed in the dark and could move very quickly on this free energy. And they were called Vimanas. And that got me going. I said, now wait a minute, these sound so like these flying saucers we had just heard about. Remember Captain, um, wasn't it Mantella? Rupert Mantella, the chap who first saw them and described them like flying saucers. So I decided I'd do a bit of research. And I went to the British Museum Library, especially the Oriental section, where um, I got out the, the whole of the Mahabharata. Lovely English literal translation by Protap Chandra Roy. No florid, just straight literal. And each chapter luckily had a summary. You know, there about 20 volumes, and I waded through and picked out everything about these Vamanas. And I just couldn't believe it, that the ancients had had them, and that they'd been in contact with space people. And it said, by means of these wonderful craft, the star people can visit Earth, and we can visit the stars. And then it described them in Tibet, was like pearls in the sky. <laughs> you couldn't have had... But then I read on, and there was things about wars in ancient India, and some of the weaponry they used with able to make three-dimensional images of a false army. Hologram, surely. A thing called the Brahma weapon, which had the power of the universe, and a light of a thousand suns, which Teller then quoted, do you remember, about the atom bomb? And it said um, that um, the survivors rushed and bathed and threw off their arms, but a few days later their hair fell out, their skin turned red, and they died of a horrible sickness. And the army was so burned, they were just like, even the elephants were shadows on the ground. Well, that was Hiroshima, surely. <laughs> so I said, you know, all this has happened before, whether it was a space war or a war among the Atlanteans, I don't know. For one entire year, Lord Desmond searched in old libraries for references to ancient UFOs. Then he completed his book. And then I got from a correspondent in America, um, D w Williamson, Rick Williamson, who said a friend of his had had a contact, a landing, and taken these amazing photographs. So I wrote to him and said I'd written this book, and could I see his photos? Well, back they all came with a lovely letter, giving me permission to use them. Mm. Nothing about any payment or anything like that. These astonishing pictures of Adamskis, which were quite unlike what we thought a UFO should look like. And we had them tested for um, atmospheric hazing and recession and all, and it came out that they were large objects, quite a long way away, and not little models close up. 
and he's saying a very nice fellow and then he wrote a rather sad little note saying that uh, I've written an account of this landing and want to publish it so my then publisher Werner Lorry which was headed by Waveney Girvan said well if you use his photos you're going to kill his book so what are we going to do so we sort of looked at the ceiling and bit our nails and waved and he said why don't we have a joint publication your book and then his as the second part I said well that's a marvelous idea George Adamski a lecturer on Tibetan philosophy and metaphysical circles had observed and photographed dozens of UFOs at that time on November the 20th 1952 together with five witnesses he drove into the Californian desert to watch for UFOs. After they had a sighting together, he separated from the group and saw a dome-shaped craft. A young man in brown overalls with long blonde hair came out of a ravine and approached him. They started communication in sign language. At the same time, his companions observed the encounter through binoculars and confirmed the contact later in notarized affidavits. Lord Desmond decided to investigate the George Adamski case on site. Well, then I eventually got over to America at a time when you couldn't take any money out of England, 1953, and um, met this amazing man, um, and he lived in a little house up on Palama Mountain with his secretary, Lucy McGuinness and Alice Wells. They're very hospitable. Making a little money hadn't affected him. And he was an incredible fellow. You know, he would sometimes really annoy you by telling you the most absurd things which you knew weren't true. And, um, and at other times he'd come out with such profound wisdom. I hope we'd be able to filter this off. And you talked to him, you asked I him? I have, more or less, on gestures and mental telepathy as it is known talk transfer. He does not speak, I mean... They, they he did not at the time, but I have met him since, and he does speak very well English as well as in the other language. Did he tell you where he came from? Yes, this time he told me he was from Venus, although I have met men out of, uh, from other planets as well. And you had to sort of dig information out of him. Now, perhaps you remember the first contact, he said he took photos and they all were burned or didn't come out because of the UFO being so near. I asked him if he had the negatives and he dug them out and they were black. But I held them up against the sun and you could see the UFO. It, it was there. The Juliet needed a lot of light to see it. He hadn't spotted that. He also hadn't spotted that the all the proportions of it were in perfect golden section. A lot of little details like that. Now, I asked the two ladies, Lucy and Alice, they said yes, they'd seen him talking to the space man, and they'd seen this flash as the UFO took off. And they also earlier, as he described, saw the big mothership. And that was chased away by a lot of American planes. And it just took off and went off. Four years later, the U.S. Air Force Project, Blue Book, officially confirmed that indeed one of their pilots chased a UFO on November the 20th, 1952, over Desert Center, California, precisely where Adamski met the spaceman. Then the other thing that worried me was the footprint of the Venusian in the sand, because it was all sort of gravel, that desert. So he directed me so I could find the place. And um, I read the book, and it said the visitor kept rubbing his foot into the ground. And I did that, and under the gravel was beautiful sand, and I left a perfect imprint of my own feet. So that, that was true. Later, Adamski claimed he was contacted by extraterrestrials who are living among us unrecognized. They invited him to fly with them into space. Aboard a huge, cigar-shaped mothership, he had the opportunity to take a look into outer space and onto the moon.
he wrote a second book about these experiences, Inside the Spaceships. Then he described to me a thing. Mind you, this was 1953-54, how he saw these fireflies in space out of the UFO window, which then, um, 1969, the first moon trip, you know, Glenn sees these fireflies in space, exactly like a damn skin. He told me there were three asteroid belts well, I believe they found a second one somewhere beyond Neptune. And he said, there's another beyond Pluto. We wait and see. And he told me how when he was on the big mother ship, they had this amazing, amazing movie. I've never seen anything like it. All the images, there was no screen, and everything happened all around you. Well, that was a hologram. <laughs> you know, no one had seen a hologram. They hadn't been invented. I believe if you read this published material, you will find the descriptions of the firefly effect that was years before John Glenn reported it in 1961. Uh, the description that there are more than nine planets in the solar system, actually 12, and we have acknowledged 11 so far. His description of the darkness of space, quite different from what you would expect to see here from the surface of the planet, also reported by the astronauts. There are numerous accounts of what he has described from space, this atmospheric collection on the moon, and activity on the surface of the moon as far as fog, clouds, water. All these things were reported by George Adamski already in the 50s, way before we had a space program. And uh, I believe that stands for itself. People can always criticize, uh, but I've yet to see any substantial, tangible evidence that anybody's ever come up with. Indeed, official NASA photographs show clouds and water on the moon, although these are impossible according to science. These photos were presented by the Danish NATO exchange officer, Major Hans C. Peterson, in a lecture in Washington, D.C. in 1995. Whether I like it or not, I have to say that science is not telling the truth. I have in my possession pictures from the moon which, one, show smoke or vapor or something else racing from a crater. Now, to have smoke racing from a crater, you need an atmosphere. Otherwise, smoke cannot race. <clears throat> so, moon has an atmosphere. Some advanced scientists today agree and say that the moon have an atmosphere, 65% or 64% of Earth's atmosphere. Well, then it can also hold water. In one of my pictures from the moon, which I have got from NASA, you see water on the moon <clears throat> in an artificial water reservoir. On the next picture, which is taken by Michael Collins on his second trip around the moon, where he photographed exactly the same area, probably because he also has seen this water reservoir, the water reservoir was gone, meaning that it was camouflaged so that we could not prove that uh, there was any water on the moon. On another picture from the moon, we see two tunnels very clearly, not just a hole in, in the cliff, but a nicely square artificial made hole into. And right in front of this tunnel, in the side, left side of the tunnel, there's a huge, thick pool or obelisk or, or what you would call it, which is clearly artificial and many 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 other things we see objects moving and leaving tracks behind nasa call them stones rolling down the moon surface but if you look closer investigate the picture closer you can actually see on shadow and light that it is rolling up the moon surface and so on and so forth so we know definitely that science is not telling the truth about our moon so that the world today is actually living on on, on one big lie a, a, about their own lives because the governments don't tell the truth they know about the visiting space people we have got a wrong story about our planets, about our moon. So our science is built on, 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 on wrong uh, teachings and so on and so forth. 
But where do the space people come from? From Mars and Venus, Adamski claimed. Impossible, according to science. But still, introductory space sciences, a textbook of the United States Air Force Academy, claims it is possible that UFOs originate from, quote, the planets in our own solar system. It furthermore confirms that one of four observed groups of extraterrestrials, quote, appear to be essentially the same as Earthmen, and that contacts, quote, may have already taken place secretly. Do they have bases on our neighboring planets? We don't know. Lord Desmond Leslie has another explanation. Now, he's, I told him at the time, I said, but surely your Venusians were etheric people, and materialize because here Venus is probably very hot and he said they were no goddamn spooks I said no nor was um, resurrected Christ you know he was fully materialized but I'm not talking no he, he wouldn't listen to that he didn't want to confuse the issue I think that was it he just didn't want to confuse because I'm also certain that some of his trips were taken astrally which, as St. Paul says, is so real you can't tell the difference. St. Paul says, whether I was in the body or out of the body, I know not. I think the most important thing I learned from George Adamski is that we on Earth are not all that unique in the universe. The universe is populated with persons like ourselves, people at various stages of development. Uh, there are billions and billions of planets around billions and billions of suns, billions and billions of galaxies. We don't know any end to the universe. But George Adamski told me that it is reasonable to believe that there are people like ourselves on other planets. Now, if we think the conditions are inimicable to human life on other planets, as for instance Venus, what do we know about higher dimensionality? So George revealed to me that there are vibrations above the vibrations that we are familiar with, the vibrations which permit tangibility, the matter of touch. I would compare it, and he compared it, as to the vibrations in light we have a spectrum, for instance, uh, ultraviolet on one side, infrared on the other, where the vibrations which we are familiar with in the center. There's also a spectrum of tangibility in the atom itself, and this is true all over the universe. And while we're familiar only with the vibrations which make the tangibility we're familiar with uh, possible on Earth, he was aware that there are other invisible tangibilities and the contact may be made. This ties in with the whole religious history of angels, for instance, from other places, of demonic uh, uh, creatures from other places. Uh, the universe is so much more complex than we had any idea of. He revealed me to me this type of a universe. Adamski's books were published worldwide, and shortly afterwards, he established a global network of friends on all continents. One of them was Major Hans Peterson of the Danish Air Force, who, after UFO observations on radar and conversations with American colleagues, became convinced that Earth is indeed visited by extraterrestrials. He organized a lecture for Adamski in Copenhagen and became convinced of the reality of his contacts. He was planning a world trip and he asked me to organize the Europe part of it. And at that time he came to my country. Now at the day of his arrival, my son Lars and I went to the local airport to meet him. And since I knew the airport well, we went to a point where we could overlook the whole airfield. And uh, it was rather low weather when the aircraft came out of the clouds. We saw that a flying saucer was just uh, 20 or 30 meters behind it. And as soon as the aircraft was fully clear and ready to land, it went back up into the clouds. When I, uh, 10 minutes later, met George, I said, uh, there was a flying saucer following your aircraft for landing. He said, oh, yes, the boys always follow me. 
and uh, this he proved later on on his trip uh, through Europe. And we arranged a hotel for him in the outskirts at a, a small town which had a harbor. And uh, we knew that nobody could disturb him because nobody would know that he would be staying there. When they came uh, late afternoon or mid-afternoon and checked in, the receptionist said that there had been a young man calling for him. Everybody wondered, but George, he just smiled. Now he said, I would like to rest a little bit so you can come and pick me up again at six o'clock for this round trip. So they did. In this old-fashioned hotel, like in many other old-fashioned hotels, there were double doors to the rooms, one opening to the outside and one opening to the inside. So there's a, a space between the two doors. When the group came to pick up George, there was a ladder laying between the two doors. And uh, on the front side, you could read the word Adamski. So he opened the ladder and inside was a message saying, Adamski, do not go to Finland this time. Trouble for you. And signed with six words. He phoned me and said, uh, I don't feel well of going to Finland because I got this warning. And I persuaded him to wait because it could be somebody who trying to make some fun out of it. Next morning early he called me again and he said, uh, I met a spaceman this morning, a man from Venus, and he handed me a small parcel which he asked me to develop to the Pope in Rome. So I will definitely not go to Finland and I'll also not go to Germany. So please make arrangements. And um, I did. Meanwhile, our group in Copenhagen was a bit skeptical that a spaceman had been around in their uh, environment. So they went to the harbor where there was an old fisherman who used to fish very early in the morning and they found him and asked him if he had been fishing this morning and he said yes, he had. And they asked him if anything special had happened, if he had talked to anybody, something like that. And he said, no. Oh yes, he said, I talked to a funny American guy, but uh, then there was a young man calling for him. So he left and I saw they were talking together. He came to London, he'd been to Rome, lecturing and um, he'd been on a European lecture tour where he met the Queen of Holland and there was a frightful row and the students tried to disrupt it and his lectures were run by Lou Zinstag, the niece of Carl Jung, lovely lady uh, with Tim Good, you know, who's written a lot of very serious books. Well, after his Roman visit, he just stayed with us for a few days to relax, and I kept the press away, and, and we took our little boat out on the Thames, and while we were there, he brought out some money, and oh, among it was a, what looked like a little gold coin. And um, he just casually said, um, that's a bit of gold no one's ever going to get off me. I said, why, it's very nice. He said, look at it, it was a little medal of Pope John, who at that time was dying, John the Twenty-Third. And he said, I saw him in Rome, he gave me this. I said, George, please, nobody sees the Pope, he's dying. Tell me you've bicycled round the rings of Saturn, I'll probably believe you, but I don't think you saw the Pope. He said, well, I did, and he gave me this, and I gave him a sealed packet from the space people. He sat up in bed, and I gave him this package. He said, oh, that's what I've been waiting and praying for. I said, what was in the package? He said, I don't know, the space people gave it to me, it was sealed. I wasn't going to ask questions, but he said, that man isn't going to die, he looks so fit and well. And then the next day, I think it was a Sunday, the news came, a Pope was dead. 
and George said, the bastards, they've murdered him. Well, they hadn't, because this is another interesting bit of evidence. Years later, the Pope's doctor told the story of Pope John's last days, how he um, had this form of cancer where in the last few days you have a false reprieve and you suddenly look very young and well and you feel marvellous and then boom. Well, that's when George saw him. But nobody knew that for many years. So then I said to Lou Zinstag, who was a Tell me, Lou, what really happened? He didn't see Pope John. She said, well, all I know is we went to the Vatican, we went to the St. Peter's Square at George's insistence, and he suddenly pointed and said, that's my man. And he, there was a priest uh, with red here. I said, well, that's probably Bishop or Monsignor, somebody rather important. And he said, they embraced like old friends, and they went off through the private entrance on the left, not the public. And I said, well, that's amazing. Then what? And she said, well, an hour later, he came out jumping up and down like a schoolboy, saying, hooray, I've seen him, I've seen, I've seen the Pope, I gave him the best. And Zeus said, if that man was an actor, he's the best actor I've ever seen. I've never seen anyone so radiantly happy. Now, interesting thing, he was with us several days before he mentioned it. You know, if it was a load of bull, he'd have probably said, look what the Pope gave me, I've seen the Pope, here's a medal. You know, not at all, he kept rather quiet about it. It just sort of came out. So I thought, well, I'm going to do one more test. Um, I was at school with Basil Hume, now Cardinal Hume. It's in the same dormitory, and I even put Eno's fruit sauce in his pot one night, and it fizzled when he peed. Anyway, we were good friends. <laughs> And I asked him, I said, listen, Basil, this little gold medal of Pope John the Twenty-Third, where can you buy it? Can you? Oh, no, not at all. You can't buy those. Only the Pope will give you those. I told him a Adamski had got one. He said, well, he must have done something very special to get one of those. And you know, Papa Pacelli, Pius XII, had a contact in the Vatican Gardens. He said he met two angels, well, okay, Venusians, and they told him there was a wonderful future ahead for our world. George Adamski's meetings with the Pope and the Queen of Holland were not his only encounters with the mighty ones of this earth. He visited the United Nations several times. Uh, one night, once I know for sure he was invited by uh, Yu Tan, the, the general secretary at that time, and he spent a full day in the United Nations, and as he said afterwards, I stayed there for one full day and I talked to a lot of people. George Adamski told me that he was able to enter any department of the government in Washington and he showed me his ordinance pass, which enabled him to do this. I was very familiar with this type of a pass because I had worked for the United States Ordinance D Department uh, between the uh, graduate work at the University of Rochester in the Physics Department and my work at Eastman Kodak Company. George was very good at keeping a secret. It was part of his integrity to be able to do so. He did this on both sides. If he had been told by the government not to speak about a thing, he did not. If he had been told by a spaceman not to uh, speak about a thing, he did not. It was not easy. He said it this way, my heart is a graveyard of secrets. At another time, this will be to go too far to tell details about it, but he left Earth for some days for another planet. I was informed beforehand that he would leave the planet and he called me right away after he came back and told me that he had to go to Washington on his uh, arrival because he had a message to the president. But he said, I cannot tell you what this message is, but if you follow the political situation on Earth, you will, for yourself, be able to see what the message contains, in one year you will see the result. And uh, one year later we had the Cuban crisis, 
And if you put your ha- hand on your heart and tell the truth, you will probably know and acknowledge that if President Kennedy had not solved the Cuba crisis just the way he did, we would have had the Third World War. For in the final analysis, our most basic common link is that we all inhabit this small planet. We all breathe the same air. We all cherish our children's futures. And we are all mortal. This is just a few details out of, you could say, hundreds of of things which you could tell, which all together fits into the picture that this man was something special, that he was telling the truth, and that those who were in power all over the world knew that he was telling the truth. Why are they still not telling the public about the existence of UFOs and extraterrestrials? Why is the government, why are they all so paranoid about this? because it's free energy. End of the oil monopoly, aviation as we know it, the automotive industry, for something much better, but, you know, they won't get their greedy little hands on it. So they'll get any lengths. When the oil runs out, they'll probably pretend they've discovered it and release it. We have a great deal to lose, both politically and economically by the type of uh, acknowledging that the fact that they're here. They propulse their craft by electromagnetic energy. This is free energy. It radiates from every planetary body and it costs nothing. Free energy, you wouldn't have to pay your light bills, gasoline for your cars, any of this, etc., etc. And we as a society, we as a world, function on the consumption of petroleum. We literally, if we stopped using petroleum, the whole world economic system would cease to exist. The type of chaos that would result, uh, the people who control the power have no intention of letting that go. That's one of the reasons. There's also religious reasons as well, because some religions teach that there's nothing up there. And uh, when they have to start acknowledging the fact that uh, life is a universal manifestation, uh, then we have to um, rethink some of the statements we have, and we're very rigid in our minds. We don't want to acknowledge anything different or change. I think you can see that in the political climate here in the United States today. Glenn Steckling, a U.S. airline pilot, controls the heritage of the UFO contactee today. The son of German immigrants became a witness of UFO sightings and encounters in his childhood, as did many others in Adamski's vicinity. Uh, My experiences with George Adamski began in 1963 when my parents and I met him and uh, later spent time with him both in Madeline Rodifer's house in Silver Springs, Maryland and also he spent time with us in our house in Alexandria, Virginia. Uh, That was due to an experience that we had in Washington where we sighted a a dome-shaped, bell-shaped craft and um, Due to that sighting, we got in contact with Mr. Damsky and then met him and subsequently spent the last two years of his life whenever he was on the East Coast together with him. I spent um, a number of times with G.A. George Adamski in Madeline's house when uh, my parents and Mrs. Rodifer would go out and arrange lecture tours and and, uh, engagements in the Washington area. And so I have very vivid memories of Mr. Damsky and uh, the sightings that we've had out at Silver Springs, uh, many others besides the, the Rota for Film, which was taken a be- month before his death, and uh, the type of people he was associated with, yes. When we moved to Denver, Colorado, we contacted Mr. Adamski after having read the book Inside the Spaceship and asked him we were about to move to Washington, D.C and if he would come and lecture in the area because I would very much like to have him there. He immediately wrote us back and he said, funny, there's a lady in Washington, D.C. who asked me the same thing, so please get in in contact with her. And so this is how we became friends with Mrs. Marilyn Rodefer and with her we experienced with Mr. Adamski, 
many, many of uh, privileged, many different experiences, such as seeing the scarred cups, such as seeing, I can't even tell you how many scarred cups or space cups we had seen over the years, because I don't think anybody would believe that. And then he went out to see that there was a scarred cup very close to his window because the very same thing happened to my husband and me some several years ago shortly before he passed away and we were sitting in the living room in the evening and a feeling of great love came over us not a personal love not an emotional love a universal love and with it came, the whole living room was lit up. And so we decided to go and take a look. And as we went outside, there was this beautiful scout cart hanging a few feet over the floor. You could see inside the hall door. It was a most fantastic sight. And this feeling stood with us, I would say, for many, many weeks. The most spectacular incident took place on February 26th, 1965, when a lady from the circle, U.S. government employee Madeline Rodifer, participated in a contact and was present when Adamski filmed an alien spaceship with her own camera at close range. We met him in March of 1964. I arranged a lecture at the Civic Center about 10 miles away at Rockville. And we became friends. I knew him only one year and one month, the last year of his life. And he visited uh, from California here about five times in that last year of his life, just uh, intermittent. He didn't stay at this house all that time. But on, on February 26th, approximately 8 o'clock in the morning, a space friend contact of Mr. Adamski came to this house. I was still asleep, but when I got up, Mr. Adamski told me that he had been told that we should get cameras ready for filming later in the day. And, of course, I didn't, had never seen one so close before, or I didn't expect that they were going to come hovering that close in my yard. I would have rented a Polaroid or prepared with more cameras, but Mr. Adamski actually helped me put film in the little 8mm Bell and Howell movie camera. And uh, he had film in his Kodak camera too. And we waited. Now, we, they, they did not tell him what time they were coming. But this, this was early in the morning. But this was middle of the afternoon, about 3.30, when we noticed them at a distance. And he, uh, we were at the dining room window looking out. And... Uh, they came in closer, and by the way, three more spacemen came and knocked at the door just before the incident. And and Mr. Adamski went, and they told him to. They said, "Get your cameras ready; they're coming." Now that is how close he was associated with those people from other planets. And uh, it's difficult to believe, but they looked just like American. One of them had brown hair, and one had dark hair, and one had slightly gray hair. And they parked in a car, I believe it was an Oldsmobile, but I don't know the year, down here at the street when they came, and then the, the spaceship came. And we went outside, but I had a broken leg. I had fallen uh, the month before in my living room, and I was in a walking cast. And uh, so, but I was able to walk around, but with a little limping difficulties, but I did get around. And, uh, but when we came out on the porch up here and started to film, uh, he told me to film and he was going to film. I said, George, I can't do this. I'm too wobbly. And I had not had the camera but two months. My husband had given it to me for Christmas just two months before. So I handed him, he said, okay, I'll do it. So I gave him my camera and he laid his down and we filmed it on, he filmed it then. I started, you know, but I wasn't sure of myself and I didn't want to miss it so I gave the camera to him and he finished filming it but I was you know humping around in the background and 
and able to walk, of course, with, uh, without too much difficulty with his cast on. But they, they only stayed about approximately 10 minutes. They did not land. They did not get out of the spacecraft, but there were glimpses of people through the, the round windows. And they, they maneuvered, they came in here, it was a low humming and a low swishing sound. And they came in, when they got close to here, they came in very slowly. And these, it was round and there were three of these, well, about this size, I guess, these landing gears underneath and they were going like this, retracting in and out. And they told George later it was for stabilization. Uh, if they'd put all of them out, they would have had to land and they kept one retracted all the time and the other two were going in and out. But anyway, low swishing, low humming sound. And it wasn't real loud, but there was definitely a motor sound accompanied with it. And uh, it was a blue, a brilliant royal, uh, between a royal and a purple and blue in color. It was a beautiful blue and deeper blue than this. And uh, it was... Uh, around and as it moved it looked crooked you know and on the film it shows this slight distortion and it looked you know lopsided and so on but they were moving and and putting on this performance for Mr. Adamski to back up you know his efforts to get the world leaders to tell the truth about the visitors from other planets they they were demonstrating they wanted him to capture this on film, their abilities to do certain maneuvers. And they wanted him to have this proof to show the people of the world because uh, our world governments have better film and they haven't shared any of them with us. And they wanted Mr. Adamski to have this piece of film to show, you know, to the audiences when he was speaking, how they do these certain maneuvers. They did this on purpose. William Sherwood, an optical physicist of Eastman Kodak, known as the father of photoelectric testing used in the optical industry ever since, analyzed the road of her film in the Eastman Kodak Laboratories in Rochester, New York. I analyzed the film frame by frame. There were 182 frames. We made enlargements of the frames. We looked for such things as double exposure, all the telltale things that you find when there's trick photography. We found out all we could about the circumstances under which the pictures were made, the distance from the camera to the object, the size of the, well, the size of the image. We didn't know the size of the object, but we derived the size of the object from a knowledge of the size of the image, the focal length of the camera, and the distance at which it was photographed. I could tell by the branch of the tree where the object hovered just where it was photographed. I went to Madeline's house. I paced off the distance. I knew exactly what the parameters were. I derived a, a value of 27 feet for the size of the object. I remember just how well this formula worked out. It's a triangular formula. The focal length of the camera was nine millimeters. The distance was 90 feet. The size of the image was 2.7 millimeters. Therefore, the size of the object had to be 27 feet. You'll find this in Timothy Hood's book. There were other factors. We brought them all to bear. There were instruments we used, which we had available in the laboratories at Eastman Kodak Company. These included densitometers, uh, photometers, projection devices of all sorts, electronic devices, everything that you could name that you could use, telephotometers, and so on. The electron microscope, I believe, was used by a man at Kodak Park. Everything pointed to the conclusion that the, the objects in the film were true objects, unknown objects, not model objects, and that it was take, taken uh, by Madeline exactly as she told us it was. People with experience, to call upon the, in, the experience of those who had concentrated on uh, the photographic film and reproducing pictures uh, meant 
more than anything else. It is not just my opinion. It's the opinion of all of the experts. One of these experts was Colonel Coleman von Kivitsky, founder of the audiovisual division of the Royal Hungarian General Staff, who worked as a film expert for the United Nations during the 1960s. Medanai Rorefer, short 8 millimeter sequence, uh, filmed on a flying object in front of her house above the trees are genuine. I was personally on the location and I verified the distance where the UFOs were flying and all the necessary environmental circumstances which excluded any kind of faking this movie film sequence. Madeline Rodefer was a medical secretary or a nurse at the United States Government Air Force. Madeline Rodefer presented a movie film at the Air Force, I think so, that was the, the Project Blue Book. When that would be fake, I don't believe that an employee of the government would show a fake movie film to the really high authorities of the United States Air Force and the Project Blue Book where, where are real professional people, uh, you know, and experts on the motion picture film and especially on the amateur film. Bob Uxler, a robotics engineer and former mission specialist of the NASA Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt, Maryland, is also convinced of the Rotifer film's authenticity. He believes the flight pattern indicates an energy field which enables the disk to maneuver independently of terrestrial gravitation. The uh, individual images as they came up uh, clearly showed something that you could not see with the naked eye in looking at the film or even looking at the individual prints under under close scrutiny and that there was a um, a haze if you will a very tight haze almost like a fuzzy outline uh, around the uh, the craft itself on the image now this of course compared to the trees uh, that are visible in the film uh, which were crystal clear and very well in focus in other words you have a very sharp contrast uh, you immediately might be concerned about the possibility of uh, uh, capabilities of double exposure, which is, of course, very difficult to do with the film. Uh, however, in this particular case, we found it very, very intriguing that the craft itself had very, very sharp contrasting uh, edges along where the porthole areas are and around the top of the cab, uh, but especially in the bottom portion of the craft, we began to see that there was uh, light-emitting uh, from the craft, but this was not a light such as a glow, like a reflection you'd get if somebody was projecting a light onto an object. Uh, this was rather interesting because uh, it, it tended to suggest that there was some form of energy uh, associated with the vehicle itself that was actually causing this sort of a red glow in the undercarriage area. Uh, but that, along with the uh, uh, glow that we were getting, the sort of a haze, a very, very distinct fine haze around and very, very close to the craft itself through the images uh, suggested that there was uh, an actual radiation effect. Uh, almost, uh, I guess you could liken it to a mirage effect. People are fairly familiar with uh, when you uh, ride down the highway during the summer uh, and you look across and you can see the heat rising and it t tends to distort images that were behind uh, the, the mirage. Well, this is very similar to the effect that we saw on this object, uh, suggesting several things. One, that you were actually looking at a three-dimensional object as something that was superimposed onto the film. Uh, that, uh, again, suggested credibility with regard to the film. Uh, and secondly, it suggested that there was technology associated with it. This was not just uh, you know, a trash can lid or something that was just casually thrown up in the air while filming was going on. So I uh, began to become much more encouraged with what I was seeing. Uh, and the more I began to look into the individual segments, uh, the, the film itself, the motion, we began to see things 
that you might uh, liken to a distortion. In other words, the craft itself uh, physically changed shape. Now, not the whole craft, but it seemed that portions of the craft changed shape. Now, this was a product either of uh, what you might call an optical illusion as a result of the technology associated with the craft, the method uh, that it used to maintain its levitated state uh, uh, to violate gravity, uh, or it was a, a mechanical apparatus associated with the craft itself. We noticed that uh, the ball structure in the bottom of the craft, uh, in concert with the receding of these individual structures, uh, that the one portion of the craft had an indentation that would go in every time this one ball would go up and then it would come back out into a round uh, uh, disc or, or circular area. So I, I think that uh, these features all collectively, more than anything else, uh, and, and even more than the testimony of, uh, of Madeleine Rota for herself and uh, the uh, historical testimony uh, of George Adamski prior to, uh, to his death regarding this, this particular event, uh, all tend to suggest that uh, we are probably dealing with an authentic case. And uh, I think it's time that uh, uh, perhaps some researchers of historical value would probably want to go back and take a much closer look at the George Adamski case uh, in its entirety. There were many attempts to discredit him, all of which I feel have successfully failed. First of all, they try to debunk his pictures and cannot do so successfully. They've claimed they were water coolers, and that was proven wrong. They tried to say they were models, that was proven wrong. They've been orthographically projected, biometrically radiation tests. Now they start to go through computer testing. Adamski's photographs have gone through more tests in the last 50 years than any other photograph out there and have stood the test of time. And I wonder if the rest of the pictures could, so, could sustain such the same test as his have. But why do you think... Um, but why do they still uh, question the reality of his experiences? Discrediting him and his message. <laughs> Adamski stood for things which are not so popular in today's uh, UFO movement. First of all, he did not believe in psychism or mysticism in this field. He felt that that belief is a different field that has nothing to do with UFOs. Because these people come from worlds where they believe in the meaning and essence of life. They don't believe that something else, whether it's the stars, whether it's the future, or anybody else is responsible for their actions. They are responsible for their actions. And so this type of information is what people tend to attack on Adamski. And he was not attacked by the officials as venomously as he is by the rest of the people in the UFO field because they feel threatened by the type of information he gave them. In September 1967, Steckling himself had a spectacular UFO sighting. In 1967, my father, mother, and I were on lecture tour in Germany, and we were traveling from Mannheim on the train, and we witnessed, along with the passengers on board this train, a armada of what we would call spacecraft or UFOs appearing and disappearing above the train, I'd say around 10,000 feet. And my father, with his 8 millimeter camera, filmed the sequence of these craft. And as the film rolls, you can see the crafts appear and disappear in formation and you can see the motion of the trees moving by as the train is in motion, so the craft are behind the trees, not in front of it. <coughs> and um, it's quite an interesting piece of film. Uh, it was reported in the newspaper the next day, the German newspaper for that particular area. On our way back from Schifferstadt to Frankfurt, we were able to film a whole amount of space car flying over, I would say, very clear to the, and very near to the Frankfurt Airport. This film and all of Mr. Adamski's film, we took as we returned to Washington, D.C., and my husband wrote letters to NASA, to the Pentagon, 
and offered them the chance to look upon the films which were available. We got invited to all of the organization, to the Pentagon, we got invited to NASA, and during during the conversation that we held with NASA, we had 22 scientists present. And none of these scientists ridiculed what we had. In fact, they were not even interested in the scout cars because they told us the size of it, how they fly, and with what they fly. These are some of the films George Adamski took by himself. He shot this one in Mexico. A cigar-shaped craft hovers over the street. Adamski took this film through the portal of a spaceship. It shows a white disc in Earth orbit. In another film from Mexico, a luminous telemeter disc moves in front of a bush. Behind the bushes, we recognize the dome of a landed scout ship. But he was telling the truth was very easy for me because I got confirmation through um, sightings I had on my own. Uh, George had a lot of sightings and he told us how small reconnaissance uh, objects, not bigger than a tennis ball, looked. He told us that there were some even uh, uh, larger, he told us there was reconnaissance object with, with a crew, normally three normal looking people and two robots. He told us there was big motherships who carried the flying saucers into the atmosphere before they released them. He told us about objects, uh, underwater objects which could fly in space or dive. And he told us that they could dive into the water without any sign of disturbances on the water. Even if the water was completely still, it was diving just like on a trick film in a movie with, with behind a mirror or something like that. And uh, over the years, I had many, many sightings where I saw these small reconnaissance objects. I saw the, the, the uh, object with a crew. I saw a mothership and I saw two landings and so on. And nothing of what I experienced was outside what George Adamski had told us. So to me, there was no problem. I had the proof that he was telling the truth. Adamski-type spaceships were observed and photographed all over the world. They have appeared over Japan and Mexico, South America and England, and in many other countries. In August of 1991, one witness was able to film a landed dome-shaped craft near Carp in Ontario, Canada. The small reconnaissance probes were photographed in Denmark and the U.S. from close range. In the south of England, Stephen Alexander filmed a telemeter ball flying over a cornfield in 1990. This spectacular footage was shot in June 1973 during one of the first flights of the Concorde. The luminous small object surrounds the supersonic plane and hovers for seconds in front of its engines. Cigar-shaped motherships were seen in similar frequency. This film was taken over Rhode Island in 1967. This photo was taken over Texas in the same year, or over Lake Onega in Russia in 1978. These films were shot in 1980 over Hagen in the Ruhr area of Germany. This official film with the Russian Space Agency was taken in June of 1992 by cosmonauts of the Mir space station. An identical object was photographed in June 1966 by U.S. astronaut McDivitt aboard Gemini 4. 
Hundreds of witnesses saw this cigar-shaped craft in April 1990 over Krasnodar in Russia. This film was taken in July 1995 in Mexico near the Popocatapetl volcano. And this cigar-shaped craft was filmed by Tim Edwards of Salidas, Colorado in September 1995. Experts who analyzed the footage came to the conclusion that the object is more than half a mile long. The mothership is surrounded by small, luminous craft. Another case from the year 1954 was even investigated by the British royal family. About two years after Adamski, a, a UFO like his landed up in where in the Lake District, the Cumberland, Lancashire, so up there on the side of Lake Coniston. And two small boys, Stephen Derbyshire and his cousin, took a little photograph, two photos of it. And in the second photo, it was moving and it was distorted. Just the way, you know, a golf club appears to be curved. They used to think it was bent. It wasn't. It's the movement of the film. And we compared them on orthographic projection to Adamski's, and they matched perfectly. <clears throat> so Prince Philip actually wanted to see them, and they were sent, arranged it through the Queen's secretary, Sir Boy Browning, who was a very nice man, and um, husband of Daphne du Maurier, who wrote Rebecca, and a great war hero. <clears throat> and, and they were taken. But the deal was no press, no inkling. And the press begged me. They even said, look, just nod, and we'll give you a thousand pounds. Well, I mean, today, I suppose some arsehole would have sold the whole story, but, um, you know, in those days, a deal was a deal. So they were, met him and they told their story. Finally, Lord Desmond encountered a spaceman by himself when Adamski visited England. Uh, he was going to lecture in Bath, and again he was staying with us. This was an earlier visit, not the one the Pope was earlier. So I took him to Paddington Station. And the sequence of events is quite interesting. It was a very grey, dull, dark day. Okay. A porter took his bags. I said, get this gentleman a first-class seat. Yes, sir. So we went. So the porter chose the seat, not us. We went into this first-class carriage with one other man sitting in it with this marvellous silver-gold hair, beautiful blue suit, and dark Polaroids. Why wear dark Polaroids, you know, on such a dark day? Apparently they, they don't like our light. And he radiated, I don't know what, he, he just had such an aura that I was almost knocked over. And he then took off his glasses and smiled at us as much, say, hello, <laughs> I brought you here. I hadn't been very well, unfortunately, and I was so sort of dismayed by this that I went out in the corridor and said, George, come here. What do you think about that chap? He said, I don't know. I said, well, I think he could be. I mean, there's something very odd about him. This orange skin, dark glasses. Anyway, I'm just making it up. So then the whistle blew and the train went. Well, I wish I'd stayed aboard, because they'd no sooner got talking than he revealed himself at the secret handshake. And um, he said he was working as a scientist in England, pretending to be one. At that time, and that time is 1963 when he was here, he had told us uh, that there were quite some living in Europe. And um, he said there were 15 living in the Scandinavian area. And uh, some stayed for a longer time, some stayed for shorter times. They came and they went and so on and so forth. Now, in the later years, we have found out that uh, they are rather active in the Swedish area. And uh, two days ago, I had a lecture in 
a society in, inside the United Nations called SEAT. And uh, a week before I left, the space people working in Sweden uh, sent me a elementary message to give to the United Nations and to the world leaders via one of the contactees in Sweden. So they are around, they are active, but in many, many cases people don't know that they are there because, as I said before, they look just like we do, they fit into our society, they even work in our society. They are interested in and concerned in our development as a race, as a society, and the type of behaviors that we display what we are doing to our planet, the destruction of the only place we have right now, we're not unlike they, they can go to different places. Uh, they're very concerned with that. And they bring a message of peace and understanding, purpose of life. It has nothing to do with fear. It has nothing to do with manipulation of the mind, nor the taking over of the world and this planet. I can assure you they have societies and much better places to live. They certainly wouldn't need this place. They've been coming amongst us for thousands of years. And we as a civilization are not very receptive to peaceful ideas. Uh, we tend to be very aggressive. Whether we burn people at the stakes, or whether we discredit them for their ideas, uh, or blatantly shoot and execute people, uh, I would be very hesitant. I would be very cautious coming to this world because we're not very stable. And so they have decided to walk amongst us more in a Peace Corps type of situation and then help individuals or individual bodies with the type of information they bring. On April the 23rd, 1965, George Adamski passed away after a heart attack. He was buried in the Arlington National Cemetery in Washington, D.C., close to the grave of President John F. Kennedy. But in the hearts of his friends and followers, he is unforgotten to this day. They are convinced he was not just an ordinary person, but a man with a mission. The last thing he showed me <laughs> before he left, and that was the last time I saw him, he pulled up his thing and showed me his navel. He didn't have one. He had a starburst incised in his belly, the depth of my finger, cut into the flesh, deep, deep, deep channels. I said, how the hell did you get that? He said, I don't know, I was born with it, I've always had it. I said, well, who are you, George? He said, well, I don't know, but you see, I cannot remember anything before I was four years old when my parents, who were Polish immigrants, came to America. And they told me, while they were waiting on the docks for the ship, with a little boy for George Adamski, a mysterious man just came up and took him away. A few minutes later, brought him back again. But he was a different child. George was a, uh, a person who was always receptive to this type of thought, and the type of message that they brought. He already spoke of it in the 30s. Um, he had uh, a number of sightings already before the uh, telescopic shots that he took in the late 40s. And uh, why not George? You can say that of anyone. Why him and not the next one? And then why not the next one and not him? It was him. And, uh, and I'm sure that they they uh, examined him by, by looking at his, his thinking and his reactions and if he would be a good person to bring this forward. He was genuine. <laughs> you could feel truth and, and genuine friendship. He was friendly and he was not, he, he was not an actor of any kind, of any, <laughs> you know, he just wasn't. He was sincere and honest and you could feel the honesty and then and the warmth from him and he was he was uh, enthusiastic and very happy at that about this film because this would help to, to silence some of the, the the critics 
and uh, he was very happy about the film and uh, and he he definitely uh, has and he had a sense of humor he definitely had a sense of humor otherwise he wouldn't have been able to withstood all the that barrage of questions from some people for hours and hours on end and sometimes it got a little argumentative too but he definitely said no no none of this he said I'm telling you the facts and I'm sharing them with you and he says it's up to you to believe it or not but he said it is important that the people of earth know that these people are here and they've been coming for hundreds and thousands of years and but now because we're about to go into space, that's what they told him, and also that we're having difficulty with atmosphere here on Earth because of pollution that would continually get worse. And remember, this was 1965, and it has occurred, too. We have many problems, as you all know, with, with uh, thick, thick and thicker pollution. George Adamski was not the only contactee. Shortly after he went public, others followed and claimed that they had similar experiences. Some of them were charlatans and cultists who spread messages of salvation and tried to deceive the gullible with cheap fake films or discredited the true contactees. But others had genuine experiences. The American rocket technician, Daniel Fry, claimed he witnessed a UFO landing near the White Sands Proving Grounds in New Mexico. He was invited aboard and received a message for mankind. The most uh, significant experience that I had is probably the finding out of uh, the major purpose for this uh, invasion, so to speak, was to keep uh, this planet alive that we're approaching an area of controversy which could result in, in, in the displacement of all humanity because we had learned how to do that without learning how to get along with each other. Later, Fry shot some films of unknown flying objects. Contactees and UFO enthusiasts met regularly at the giant rock in the Californian desert at the site where contactee George Van Tassel claimed to have met space people and where he later built, allegedly under their instruction, the Integraton, a generator to reactivate human cells and to charge them with cosmic energy, as claimed by Van Tassel. One of the early contactees who spoke regularly on the giant rock conventions was Howard Menger. Menger presented what many UFO enthusiasts had long waited for, physical evidence and a message of deepness and beauty. I was inspired by a trip to New York State in the Catskills. I was on my way up there under some kind of control. It seemed almost like my, the wheel was moving by itself. I know it sounds strange, but it, it's true. And I reached a, an old cabin in the woods, and inside there were what I considered to be aliens. Uh, they were not uh, from this world, as far as I could see. They're very angelic uh, uh, p uh, people. And they had all kinds of instruments in the cabin, uh, all types of electronic, uh, like what we'd call uh, pianos and organs. And on the uh, wall, they had a one-inch thick two-by-two two television screen. And they could move it anywhere they wanted to. Uh, I think we're getting that nowadays. We're getting into that now, uh, 35, 40 years later. But... I went in there and they showed me the instruments, the musical instruments, and I expressed the wish that I wish I could play the piano. And they said, well, uh, maybe we can help you. I don't know what they did, but I could sit down after that visit 
to the cabin after meeting these wonderful people, and I could play anything by ear. I think it all began when I was very young, approximately 10 years old, in the early 30s, when I went up into the woods, as I often did, uh, and saw a beautiful lady on, on a rock with a stream going by. And I was really, really surprised because <clears throat> first I thought it was one of the farm people, because there were farms nearby. But this woman wasn't dressed in a farm outfit. She was dressed in beautiful, flowing gown. And she had long blonde hair and gold-colored eyes. And she seemed to be waiting for me, uh, as though uh, she knew I'd be there. And when, when she spoke, she spoke in perfect English and a beautiful voice. And I was only 10 years old, but I want to tell you, this, this was quite an experience. She was like an angel, like talking to an angel. And she seemed to know all about me. And she mentioned some things that would happen in the near future. She departed like almost like a vision, just disappeared. And I went back home. I didn't talk about it for, for weeks not even to my brother, uh, who often went up in the woods with me. We saw discs in the sky, my brother and I, uh, during that period, that same period. And as uh, time went on, some of the things that she had predicted were coming true. They continued from the girl on the rock right on up to uh, the very significant ones in 1956, when the craft came in these huge 40 to 50 foot craft and they carried these beautiful angelic aliens and uh, at, of course at first I wasn't ready for any of this no cameras no recording equipment no witnesses but after that I prepared myself with cameras uh, uh, witnesses I had witnesses I had uh, I was taking a movie on one incident in 1956 in Highbridge New Jersey uh, where a craft was coming in. It's in my new book, The uh, Highbridge Incident. The pictures are in there. And the craft is coming in, and I'm taking a, a colored movie, eight millimeter movie of this. I have, I have several witnesses from the local area and also a federal agent from the Bureau in Newark, New Jersey was standing right next to me. I was filming a craft coming in. The door opens when it landed, and two men got out. One went to the left, one went to the right, and then a beautiful lady got out. But she had a type of spacesuit on. And she walked toward me, and when she got about 25 or 30 feet from me, she didn't say a word. And she touched something shiny on her belt, and that shiny thing got bigger and bigger and bigger and finally enveloped her whole body to where I could see her body as a light form. And then it disappeared. And I, I was really, uh, really uh, surprised. Uh, I yelled back at the craft. I said, where did she go? Where is she? And they yelled back in perfect Oxford English, she's here with us in the ship. So evidently their technology has taken them into some type of teleportation, which we haven't, we haven't approached that yet. Our scientists have not approached that yet, that I know of. And so uh, evidently they, uh, they have mastered time, motion, and energy in some way. Uh, shortly after that, the, door, the two men went in the craft the door closed and it silently rose and left the area. I only have parts of it and slides I made from the original. The Federal Bureau of Investigation, the Bureau out of Newark, New Jersey, took the original film. As you know, there is a definite government cover-up for three reasons, political, religious, and scientific, and for national security. Indeed, Manger had hundreds of eyewitnesses at that time. Psychiatrist Dr. Berthold Schwartz spoke with about 40 of them and became convinced that Menger's contacts were real experiences. 
Well, living in northern New Jersey, where I practiced medicine for many years, I used to hear years ago on the radio Howard Menger on the Long John Neville show. And I was quite interested, to put it mildly, how could someone make these statements and make all these claims and these other things going on? Then, of course, reading about it in the papers, and my patients would ask questions, people across the board, straight Americans. So one thing led to another, and then by fortuitous luck or whatever, coincidence, I met different people that were closely associated with Howard, leading citizens, not just average Joes, good, solid Americans. And they had quite a story to tell me. So the ball of yarn started to unroll, and I became more and more involved. And who this man is, where he's coming from, how do you explain these things? One man himself was quite a well-known inventor. He knew Howard's family. Another one was a leading reporter for the highest circulation paper in northern New Jersey, who happened to be a classmate of my roommate at Dartmouth College years ago. So I had a, a contact there. The fellow opened up. He did a whole series of stories. And he said, I don't know this thing, but it, Howard is truthful. He's telling it as it is. The story never changes. It's the same way. And in that town of Washington, New Jersey, I interviewed this high school principal. At that time, I interviewed a blind lady, but a very refined woman of some note locally. And she told me quite a story with another teacher, a physician. Oh, gosh, you name it. Another fellow lived in the south park where they have all the hunting and he kept on the moon potatoes that Howard had so-called the specimen he picked up wherever he was out in space who knows but these people swore by him they told some extraordinary stories what did those eyewitnesses see what did they describe well, I remember ones of course the uh, craft or whatever they are the lights in the sky and the landings in the field the, the great sociological psychosocial significance of thousands of people present and again, through synchronicity or luck, I had this patient whose father happened to be in the state police of New Jersey. So they wouldn't, as a physician, they're usually most courteous to me, occupationally perhaps. I went in and they opened the door and they said, we cannot explain this. We do not understand it. But yes, this is on the level. These strange things happen. And matter of fact, you couldn't shut them up. They <laughs> had to go on and on. So quite a story. Uh, there were people that said they saw um, lights in the sky and things that darted very fast that didn't look like uh, a helicopter or a plane because it moved too swiftly. And I remember uh, we all came down to look at the field where the flying saucer had landed, where he said it had landed. And it was round, like burnt mark on the ground where the grass had all been singed. And in the 1950s, a young high school boy came to me and said this man was taking him up in the wood and showing them lights that glowed. And he told them the lights came from flying saucers, from men who were landing regularly in a place called High Bridge, New Jersey. It's about 10 miles from here, from Washington, where we are now. And I knew this young boy, and I... Uh, prevail upon him to uh, tell me more about it. I was interested as a newspaper man, and uh, he told me who the man was, and it was Howard Menger. At that time, Howard Menger was a sign painter in a sign painting shop just about two blocks from this house, up around the corner. And I knew Howard, knew his wife, knew his children, knew his family. And um, as a reporter, I thought, I have to find out more about this. So I got a hold of a couple of friends of mine from the state police and uh, we went to visit Howard and he said oh yeah they're up there and he showed us some photographs he had made of flying saucers and he asked us if we would like to uh, meet these people from outer space and of course we said yes so he took us up to a field up on top of the mountain and said they'd be there at about 11 o'clock at night and uh, we just had to wait and uh, needless to say we waited and waited and nobody ever showed up Howard later told me, he said, one of those guys that was with you was carrying a gun. 
Mr. Howard, all those guys were carrying guns. They're all state police, state policemen. One evening, uh, he advised me that there would be a sighting, he believed, so I took a, a girl I was dating at the time, whose name was Dorothy, and his and a friend uh, uh, who worked for my father, his name was Richard Barry, and he was repairing televisions for my father. He was a student, I think, of Princeton at the time. I couldn't drive, I didn't have a license at the time, so Richard drove Dorothy and myself down there and... We met at Howard's house, sat in his kitchen, had cocoa, as I recall, and he said, let's go up into the woods and we'll see if... I said, I think the ships are here. So we did. And it was Howard, his wife Rose, his sister-in-law Mary, who I think was single at the time, myself, Dorothy, and Mr. Barry. So, And we broke up into groups. Howard and uh, uh, two of the women went one way, and myself and Mr. Barry and Dorothy went another way and, was, and we walked down this wood trail and we did see these pulsating lights in a ravine uh, kind of hovering on the ground and uh, these were believed to be the uh, he said they were scout ships and they seemed to be uh, translucent like you could see through them and they seemed to have bright, brighter cores inside like a vacuum, like a light bulb would do or a vacuum tube would do. And they would change colors. They'd be pink and then they'd be green and then they'd be white and whatever. And they just kind of seemed to hover over the ground. One of them did seem to put out a little light which kind of went round us, I think, and then went back in again. And uh, we were awestruck. There's no doubt about that. I remember, I'm 16 years old and never saw anything like this in my life and quite believed everything that we saw was in fact out of this world. So we went back down to his house and he said, I think one of the alien people uh, trust this group and they're going to make themselves visible. So we went out and stood in his backyard in, in a lawn area and it goes up to a hillside, it was in Meadows, and within a short period of time, Howard says, look, here comes one now. And it was this kind of ghosty apparition of a, of a human figure, which kind of floated across the meadow. I remember he kind of went over a fence, kind of just floated over a, a, a barbed wire fence, and uh, came near to us, but not that near that you could distinguish any features. I'm talking maybe several hundred feet. And then he faded away back into the woodland. And that was it. And we went back to the house and we were just like, whoa. <laughs> Greatest thing that ever was. Another incident I recall vividly, Augie, Augie Roberts, the photographer who was documented so much of this from the early days forward, was once at Howard's house, where Howard was, just after a whole series of exciting events out in the field with the craft landing, whatever the thing was. And Howard was alone in the house. Augie knew that. And yet Howard was carrying on a conversation with another voice. Now, unless Howard is the world's greatest ventriloquist, which to my knowledge he isn't, Augie said, what is going on here? One of the curious who wanted to see firsthand what was behind Menger's contacts was the young journalist, Constant Michels. She was so fascinated by the young contactee that she felt in love and married Howard Menger in 1958. Shortly after that, she had her own first UFO encounter. I have never seen a landed disc, but one evening shortly after we, we were married, we were coming home from grocery shopping, and as we came up on the hill on the farm, we parked the car against the fence, and there was a big luminous pearl-like, pearl uh, spherical shape right above the trees over the next field. And Howard stopped, he said, look, and I said, oh, wait, I've got to get my camera. And I, by the time I got to the station where I can turn around and get the camera, it was gone. That was one of the times. When we were on our honeymoon in Las Vegas, we saw the same pearl-like iridescent glo globular disc. And uh, one more time, which this, this really gets me, but it was in um, 
hunt, it was on our farm, and we were there, our attorney was with us, and uh, we had heard that some people at White House, they were having a game, and they had seen discs flying over the stadium. So we went out to in the field and looked upward, and sure enough, there was a fleet of discs flying overhead. And our attorney turned to me and said, Connie, this is for you. And one of the discs dipped, just like that. And that was that day or that week I became cognizant of the fact that I was uh, pregnant. I was with child, our first child. Uh, Howard Menger is a, a, a truthful person who's had some extraordinary experiences. And as I think he says himself, he cannot explain them. He doesn't understand them. My impression of Howard Menger was that he was a, uh, uh, a man who... Uh, most people would like. He was quiet. He was calm. Uh, he appeared to be a very thoughtful man. He would seldom give out with a fast answer. He would consider his words and his answers to every question you would ask him. Uh, he was a kind man. He was a kind of a person that you'd like to have as a neighbor. Uh, he minded his own business, he was on the quiet side, and uh, he would, it, that's why I think it, uh, he commands so much um, respect, because people don't expect to have a guy talking about flying saucers who looks and talks like Howard Menger. He's a father figure. As a psychiatrist, I certainly would say that uh, Howard appears in every way to myself to be a healthy good citizen, a sound body, mind and body, as most of these people are. We've done formal studies on this long ago. It was just logical to assume that there are non-terrestrials throughout our cosmos. And if they are coming now, as they have come in the past, why could not this young man, who had a good business, who had a family life, who was well known in his community, was well respected, why should he go through all this trouble to get ridiculed and harassed and lose a lot of his business, and for what purpose? It certainly wasn't for money. We, we lost heavily trying to get this, mu uh, this message across. He eventually lost his first home, and when we were married, we lost our farm home, and we had to just pull up stakes and start all over again, no home at all, and work very hard. So for all those uh, skeptics out there and debunkers, we get very angry, especially I do, when they say, well, you're doing it for money, or you're trying to sell your book. We have mortgaged our home to publish that book because we didn't want it altered, and we didn't want the photographs to turn up missing again. So we did it ourselves. So this is not a labor of money, it's a labor of love that we have done for 35 to 40 years. So I was convinced at that time that, that he was doing it for the same reason. He was losing pitifully, economically. But something was uh, really pushing him on. And I'm very glad that later on the government came and, 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 back, and backed him up to do some of the things he had to do. Unfortunately, it didn't last very long. Menger's most fascinating adventure with the space people was his trip to the moon in August 1956. Well, I remember getting in a craft in the same location. We called it Location One in Highbridge, New Jersey. They invited me in the craft. And they didn't tell me right away where we were going, but I found myself in outer space with a Polaroid camera, and there were about eight or nine people in there with me, aliens, and another uh, a man, a friend of mine from Hybers, New Jersey, who at this still, I still don't mention his name because he didn't want to mention it, but he was in the craft with me. Went to school with him. We were up, we could see through the portholes the earth getting smaller and smaller and smaller. It looked like a blue tennis ball with white uh, clouds over it. Finally, we could see the moon 
approaching and, and, and getting larger and larger through the portholes, and I took pictures of the moon on the other side of the moon, where there's a, uh, a line between the light and the dark, and there was like a small city there. And our government knows all of this. They know it all, but they're keeping it from the public. Time is very difficult when you're flying in these aircraft. For instance, there's something I did notice on the moon trip. I thought it took 10 days. But when I come back, I didn't have to shave. So that's less than eight hours. So there's something here in their technology about time. They're time travelers. As far as I know, their technology is so advanced, we may never even have left the planet in a craft. We might have gotten in a craft, and through their technology, uh, contacted the moon section and put it on a screen, and I thought, who knows? They're so far ahead of us that I really don't know. Any time that he came back from what he called a contact, he seemed to be very elated, very, very uh, happy and elated and, and uh, just bursting with, with uh, happiness or goodwill. It, it seemed to affect him that way. The early phase of his contacts with the extraterrestrial visitors inspired Menger to develop theories about electromagnetism and gravitation and to experiment with exotic UFO propulsions on this base. So what happens in my theory is that the electromagnetic field surrounds the disk, cuts off the cosmic particles coming in so that gravity, which is a push, my theory, uh, is no longer a push in this area because it rises, allowing it to rise, it cancels out the push that I call gravity. That's my own explanation. Now, whether it's true or not, you know what? I don't really know. But on that theory, I did get a craft off the ground. 1951 was when it, things really happened because I built an anti-gravitic electrodynamic propulsion four-foot radio-controlled craft, which looked like a flying saucer. And I flew it quite a bit around Highbridge, New Jersey. And one time in the afternoon, my it got away. My controls, I lost control of it, the radio control. And it went up about 500 feet and then went west. And I pushing buttons like mad and it just didn't respond, it got away. And I, there goes approximately, today's dollars, $60,000. Now in those days, money, a dollar was a dollar. And it took me two or three years, a period of that time, to come up saving that kind of money and buying the parts to build a craft like that. But it was successful because two weeks later, FBI agents came out of Newark, New Jersey, to my shop in Washington, New Jersey. I had a machine shop and sign shop there. And they said, Howard Menger? I said, yes. They said, well, we want to tell you that your craft crashed, and they showed me the pieces, on the Ohio-Pennsylvania border, which is several hundred miles from Highbridge, New Jersey. So that's, uh, and it crashed. I don't know whether it hit a tree or what happened. And uh, they traced me from the parts. I bought these parts in electronic shops and hardware stores on Route 22 in New Jersey. And they traced, they went to these stores and traced it down. And they're very good at this. And they came right to my shop and said, stop, don't do it again. Keep quiet. The, you will be visited by some representatives from the Pentagon. They are interested in the propulsion system. So by the time 19, uh, in the fifth, late 50s, they kept coming back in this mat. I didn't put a lot in the book about this because they said not to. But in 19, in the 60s, they didn't have a contract, as you spoke of, but they did sponsor me to go to Colorado Springs and actually build 
in cooperation with 80 other scientists, engineers, and all types of, 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 of men who knew what they were doing, build a between 40, 50 foot craft and it flew successfully. And we were shushed up, none of us could talk, and uh, it, was a, it was a wonderful experience. All paid for by the government. I have a picture uh, of a Mercedes Benz that the government paid for for me to travel back and forth uh, Colorado Springs and, uh, and Highbridge, New Jersey. The deal with the government had its price. Menger had to leave the UFO movement completely. Yes, they did silence me. I silenced uh, under, uh, 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 voluntarily because of national security, which was their biggest reason. And being a patriotic citizen and a veteran of the United States uh, Army intelligence uh, uh, back in uh, World War II, yes, uh, I did uh, keep quiet for uh, security reasons. Uh, because though in those days, the Soviet Union was at odds with us. They were our enemies. And uh, they didn't want this technology or any of this out for fear that it would get in the, hand, the wrong hands and used against us. For a time there, we had to give it up entirely, any contacts with uh, UFOs or... And Howard was gone so much of the time. He was involved with the government which is it's very, it's very difficult for the family, I want to tell you. When you're dealing in intelligence work, it's very difficult for wife and family because your husband can't tell you exactly what he's doing or where he's going or when and if he's coming back. And that's all left up to conjecture, and it gets to be very uncomfortable at times. And, uh, however, that was resolved eventually, and Howard decided to give it all up and just devote his time to, uh, to me and to the children and to his work until such times it would be more appropriate for us to talk about his experiences and our experiences together. But his life, his thinking, still was overshadowed by his experiences with the space people. They even influenced the life of his children, Heidi and Eric. Deeply. Yeah, well, that would, the philosophy was probably the best thing they gave me anyway, mm -hmm. I think. It's, it's given me a good open-mindedness and <coughs> a good stable foundation. Yeah, that's probably the best thing, if anything, that they gave us. It gave me the niche to my music because um, I'm a musician and and um, I went through all types of music from Baroque, opera, jazz, um, modern music. And the only way I really found the way I wanted to go was through the faith that I have. And it was really from the core of our family that I got that faith. You're dealing with a human being who's had an extraordinary experience and is bursting with knowledge and wants to tell all that he knows, but sometimes cannot. And it leaks out over the years, and persistent questioning, and, re and, and uh, going over the events very carefully, trying to remember the, what I call, parables that the non-terrestrials told him, trying to figure it out ourselves what they meant, what the knowledge was, and realizing that it was we who had to do the searching and find out what it all meant, that we were not going to be given a textbook for aliens. We had to figure it out ourselves. And when we finally did, we found out that we had it in us all the time because we've been seated by our non-terrestrial ancestors. So it was there, it just had to be probed, which means that we couldn't, we didn't lead an average, normal, everyday life, although we did this to maintain family, our minds were always probing and always interested in reaching into that exciting field of non-terrestrials and what it really meant to us as humankind, because there's more to us than one can ever imagine. 
When the space people ended their contact with Menger in 1958, they left many unanswered questions. Well, they left. Uh, the original angelic people that I talked with years ago in the uh, 50s, in the 30s, the girl on a rock, and then the 50s, and, and the many trips in the craft, uh, they said that they would be back in 2012. Uh, that they go in cycles, like, you know, but I believe that they are time travelers and that they have bases on Venus, Mars, and many other planets. Uh, I asked them once, well, where did you come from? And they said, we have just come from the planet you call Venus. Well, that doesn't mean they're Ven Venusians. They're, they're travelers. They might have a base there. When our astronauts went to the moon and they came back, they were not moon men. They traveled there and back. They were Earth people. So who is to say where they come from? The one thing I'm sure is, almost sure, they don't come from this planet. And they're way ahead of us in political, scientific, and religious understanding. I asked them, why are you here? Well, are you here to heal people or solve all our problems and blah, blah, and all this? He said, no, it is against our universal laws to, to interfere in any civilization which we descend upon. Your record, your history shows that at your advanced civilizations have advanced on lower civilizations and have destroyed them. They've been here thousands of years ago when there was oceans where, there's, where, there, where there is now land, and where there was then land, there are now oceans. And when they come back, the civilizations have gone down, disappeared, like Atlantis and some of the others. They come back to check on, on us. They are our ancestors. They helped us to rise up from Homo sapiens to where we are now, to a thinking human being who can make tools and who invent te technological uh, things to help humans live a, a better life. They said that they have laid down laws thousands of years ago that are, some of, most of them are in our scriptures today. Various Bibles all over the world. Holy books all over the world have come, they said, from extraterrestrial contacts because they were considered gods in those days and looked up to and worshipped. We even made statues that looked like them. And so uh, they said, all we have to do is read our scriptures, live the life it recommends in the scriptures, all the Bibles all over the world said, Thou shalt not kill, don't kill. Don't covet your neighbor's wife, don't do that. Love thy neighbor, do that. Moses, Buddha, Jesus, all said all of these things. They were contacted by these aliens, angelic uh, beings also. Connie Manger believes that there is a strategy behind the proceeding of the extraterrestrials, a program to educate us step by step. The alien receptiveness program is to gradually make us aware of our birthright, but it has to be a very slow process, and the memory of who we are and what we are is locked in our mythology, it's locked in our ancient scriptures, it's locked in ancient books, it's all over the world. If you will collate the uh, information, you will see the pattern emerge. However, we have to go very slowly because the memory of that has been obliterated from most of humankind. And as a matter of fact, we may have been a quarantined planet for a long stretch of time. And now that we are being monitored again, and some of the brain cells that they so 
so graciously gave us are beginning to expand and they are beginning to recognize, at least a lot of us are beginning to recognize, we belong to a galactic family. Now, how? What? what is our purpose? Our purpose is to inform as many people as possible and give some scientific background to that, to show them that there is a possibility that we are not alone and that we come from a very different heritage other than anthropoid. As a matter of fact, we're children of the stars, but we've come through an evolutionary process because that's nature's way of producing better forms for better life expressions. They leak information out either by direct isolated contact cases and or holographic means to get the message out slowly so that the mind has a chance to adjust. There is a mental adjustment that needs to be done. And that needs to be done first on a slow scale and then as it accelerates, it will become worldwide. And there, that's where the consciousness upliftment comes in. That if once they know that there is others out there and they're very much like us and that's why they're sending those entities that look most like us and are probably very close to us biologically as I said before because they're our family and there is another reason it must be done slow on a slow process because a higher culture will always destroy the lower a lower structure we have infrastructure in our industries in our governments in our religions that would fight so so fiercely against this thought or against others coming in because after all the vested interests have control of this planet and control of the countries and control of the wealth they 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 don't want to have to deal with this on a hostile level it has to be done slowly and it has to be changing the mental set first it's one reason they're here is for a spiritual uh, uh, reason to develop us more on a spiritual level Technology is advancing quicker and going uh, further ahead than our spirituality, and that's very dangerous. Personally, I feel that we have to have a greater reverence for life, all life, greater respect for our planet, greater expression of intelligence between each other, and greater care and responsibility for everything that we do. We have to take responsibility and take charge for what is happening today because that is the only way we can change it. And once we do these things, we become, I wouldn't like to use the word worthy, we become more uh, receptive to contacts with other people. Thank you.